and welcome to the Cars Guide podcast. We're ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. Now, our usual host, James Cleary, is away this week. You must know he's uh, competing in the Northern Beaches Cross Country Championship. It's actually been cancelled because of COVID, but he's he's going it alone anyway. He's taken the day off. He's, he's, that's the type of guy he is. He's going solo. So good luck, James. Hope you, hope you make it through. It's his fifth year running. Uh, but that's okay. Instead, you've got the third, maybe fourth, possibly fifth best thing. You've got me. I'm senior journalist Richard Berry, and I am joined by Cars Guide journalist Tom White. Hello. And the man that we are now legally allowed to call LC300. That's <laughs> right. It's our valued, very valued contributor, Andrew Land Cruiser, Chesto Chesterton. Speak, speak here, bench warmers. Here I am. <laughs> Look, Chesto's not only a reviewer, he's one of our one of the best news hounds in the business. He breaks so many Toyota stories that senior executives at Toyota have actually told us, now this is the truth, that they read Chesto stories to find out what they're actually doing themselves. Isn't that right, Tom? <laughs> it is very true. Yeah, I was, I was told that. I've, Look, so, I've got about a 20% strike rate at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, it's not bad, not bad odds. It's only appropriate then that this week we're talking about the Toyota Land Cruiser. Chesto has got a big, big bombshell, which he's dropped on the Cars Guide website. Uh, we know what engine the Land Cruiser is arriving with. Chesto thinks he knows, uh, oh, okay, pretty pretty concrete evidence, actually, of what it's going to be priced at. And uh, we're going to tell you how you can get your hands on one first. So stay tuned for that. We'll also be discussing the newest additions to our Cars Guide garage. And we'll dive into your thoughts in last week's episode. Last week, we were talking about Kiwi cards that we don't get. So cards that New Zealand gets at Australia. This is out on. Now, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapters in the timeline too. So let's go. Now, Chesto, your yep. Land Cruiser story. It's, look, it's a constant stream of Land Cruiser stories from you. It's a really, really hot topic. In this story, you talk about that the Toyota website now officially has, and it's hard to find because I went and, and dug through and found it, has an expressions of interest area where future Land Cruiser owners of the LC300, the new generation Land Cruiser can sign up and they'll be first in line. Is that the case? Yeah, well, look, yeah, they'll, they'll, they can certainly register interest and be part of that as sort of initial order allocation. Uh, but the interesting thing about this, though, is that the LC100 for so long has kind of been uh, sort of vaguely covered in darkness and secrecy and mystery. And even though we kind of knew what was coming and we, we had some pretty solid sources and um, so we, we kind of knew the engine six or eight months ago, for example, mm. this is really the first time that Toyota in Australia has properly gone on the record and, and, and told people what to expect from the vehicle when it arrives in Australia. Now, they haven't quite told us exactly when to expect it. They've only drawn it down on Q3, but... Remember, the car is launching globally in August, and it's such an important car for our market that uh, we'd expect it to launch about the same time, so around August, September in Australia as well. But the interesting thing is they, they are describing it as the most rugged and powerful Land Cruiser ever made, which, of course, is a bit of marketing hype, but is also accurate because we know now that it will arrive in Australia exclusively, at least initially, packing the diesel engine, which makes sense. We, we are a massively diesel market. We know that there's uh, petrol options internationally. We know there's talk of potential hybrids in the future, but at least in the short term, Toyota's putting all its eggs in the diesel basket. But what a diesel basket. It's a 3.3 litre twin turbo diesel, 227 kilowatts and 700 newton metres. And if you're playing along at home, that is substantially more than your LC200. Uh, Even though it's not a V8, though, because it's a V6, isn't it, Chesto? Yeah, it's a V6. But uh, look, Sean Hanley from Toyota, who, who, who's always good for an engaging quote, <laughs> yes. made, made the point that you really can't deny. He said, you know, it has been so long since, since the Holden and Ford heyday where performance in any country was measured by the number of cylinders. And that's true. You know, this is a more powerful, more efficient engine than the V8 it replaces. And so it should be as technology improves, you know. Um, there was a time, of course, where to get more power, you needed more cylinders, but those days are over. So I, I, don't, I don't see an issue with a, with a V6 at all. No, same, same brake towing capacity, 3.5 tonnes. Yeah. Uh, still on a ladder frame chassis, even though it's the new Toyota. That's right. Um, what else do we know? It's a twin turbo V6. Uh, the hybrid. Now, we, we thought we might be getting a hybrid. Is that, does, is that ruled out altogether? Or could it still come down the track? 
I'll, I'll circle back to that in just one moment. Yep. What, what we know about the car it is lots now. We, we of mm. course know that it debut, debuts a ladder frame TNGA platform for the first time. We know that it's got the 3.3 litre twin turbo six, but we also know that it, it at least matches and in most cases exceeds the capability of the car it replaces. So whether that's approach and departure angles or ground clearance or, 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 or towing or, or anything else that you can really measure a car's capability by, we know the LC300 will at least match and in most cases better. I, I haven't been able to find anywhere yet that it's actually worse, except potentially for price, but we'll circle back to that <laughs> in just a moment. Now, the only downside with that diesel engine is, yes, we were told that there would be a hybrid coming or, or there were at least rumours of a hybrid coming. It now seems that that hybrid's going to end up in the Lexus LX again, at least initially. Mm. It seems that the, the big boffins at Toyota have decided that that's a pretty clear point of difference between the two models. Give the luxury Lexus the, hy the hybrid tech, give the, the more sort of mainstream Toyota the traditional diesel and petrol tech. But what we know about that hybrid now, or at least what we think we know, according to Japanese sleuths, is that it's really impressive. Now, again, mm. it's uh, the, the 3.3 litre V6 is 227 kilowatts and 700 newton metres, and they are big numbers. But the hybrid, which of course pairs with the twin turbo V6 engine, is good for 358 kilowatts and 870 newton metres. Yeah. A massive yeah. numbers. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I reckon that's a really clever engine, depending on what you're doing with the car, obviously, but it promises to be more powerful and potentially more efficient than the diesel and the LC300. Now, Tom, you are our EV guru. Do, you, do we need a hybrid version of the Land Cruiser is, or is this a piece of farm equipment which really needs to be diesel? I think that depends on the buyer, doesn't it? Because, uh, yeah. you know, there's a buyer who is only ever going to buy the diesel. There's mm -hmm. a buyer who's only ever going to buy the petrol. And... I think there's an emerging buyer who would consider the hybrid. Um, I think now that you know, we talked about this before, but now that I'm thinking more about it, maybe this is a smart move because I think the Lexus buyer is the one who is more likely to consider the hybrid. They're more likely to mill around town. Whereas, you know, for the LC 300, it's more, let's, let's sell the cars that people are going to buy first. Yeah. And then let's bring in the experimental one later. You know, maybe that's a room of opportunity. Maybe they are going to say, hey, look, it's only the Lexus one. But it'll be interesting to see either way because, you know, we know you can get these kind of hybrid systems that boost the amount of power available. They're not just there sheerly for efficiency. And for off-road capability and... You know, there are a few cars that do this now, um, but theoretically you can get that kind of uh, lag-free torque boost, yeah. you know, when you're climbing rocks and articulating and, and whatever it, it should be. So it will be really interesting to see um, how capable it is. Um, Mate, I, I'm excited about it. But uh, and the, the other interesting thing is how new it is. Like, like to have to have an electric motor in a hybrid system that can pull something this heavy with all four wheels is is pretty new. So it pairs it with a very big engine to be fair, but I, but I, I do think that it's a it's a marketing masterstroke from Toyota because can you imagine if they, but they remember the outrage at them dropping the diesel V8. Mm. Imagine they said not only are we dropping the diesel V8, but we're replacing yeah. it with a petrol hybrid. You know, people would have been supplied to Toyota dealerships. And I guess if you look at those kind of nonsensical marketing funnels that marketing teams are always pumping out, you would think that like, or, or, or even the sort of Venn diagrams, you would think that it's the, it is probably the 300 series that's going to be doing most of the long distance touring. Yeah. And you would think the LX is probably going to be a more urban slash suburban focused vehicle. And then somewhere yeah. in the middle, there'll be some crossovers. So it does make sense that they would get a petrol hybrid and, and the long distance haulers and get the diesel. You're absolutely right. They, they'd have they'd have three rooms at Toyota. They'd have a hybrid room with a Land Cruiser hybrid already sitting in it. Oh yeah. They'd have they'd have the diesel room and the petrol room, and they'd know they'd know. Oh, they're not ready. They're not ready for room three yet. We're going to give them room number one with a diesel V6. Yeah. Then we're going to bring in a petrol. Then we're going to bring in a hybrid. And in room number four, we have an all electric one, which they won't be ready for for at least twenty years. And then the hydrogen um, <laughs> yeah, one. That. Yeah, that's right. And I mean and the other room. I, I think the hydrogen the one they, um, is they, they do have more rooms than any other manufacturer. Like that's right. Room the number there's, a, there's, an, there's another room with a UFO in it. They're going to bring that out when we're ready to see that as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, I think you're right about Lexus, though. Lexus seems to be, you know, favoured by purchases that are a little bit more progressive, I think is the right word. You know, they began with the CT200H and 
you know, although Toyota does now have a hybrid version of nearly every single model in their entire, you know, lineup, um, I don't think it would ruffle that many feathers to have a hybrid Land Cruiser in I've, there as I've well. I've told you my sort of controversial view on Toyota and its hybrid push because it, they, they, they are kind of the a case study in having your cake and eating it too. Mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on, on one side, they're doing great work with hybrid vehicles and, and really the proliferation of those and the take up has been through the roof and they started that trend. So it's, it's only fair that they should reap the rewards. But on the other side, all, while they're talking about all this environmental goodness, on the other side, I think that they were up until this vehicle comes out, they would hands down be the biggest seller of V8 engines in Australia. Like yeah. who would sell more V8s mm -hmm. than Toyota, right? So exactly they, they, right. they have got a siloed business where on one side, they're kind of like, you know, raising raising a fist to a green future. And on the other side, they're pumping out V8s like nobody's business. So it's a win-win. There's, so, there's the other element of that as well, I think, where it's, you know, the, a lot of these hybrid drivetrains are really old. And, right. and yeah, okay, Toyota invested in this 20 years ago. And yeah, okay, they can reap the benefit of it now. But, you know, one thing that is occasionally brought up is, you know, is this clean? You know, yeah, uh, if we're using a 20 year old engine with a, a okay, cool. You know, you bolt a, you bolt a electric motor to the front of it and, yeah. you know, some old battery tech in the back of it. Does that, does that make it clean just well, because you're burning slightly less fuel? That's the big, the, the war of words at the moment between Volkswagen and Toyota. We've got yeah. Volkswagen accusing other manufacturers of being so called green when their hybrids run on, you know, 95 or 90, even 91. Um, yeah. So, you know, how clean is that? Uh, in, in terms of sulfur content in, in mm. petrol in Australia, um, prices, uh, Chesto. Yes. What are we What are we looking at? Land cruisers don't come cheap, um, and they, as they with any new, no, and as with any new generation car, they always bump up the price a bit. What are we expecting to pay for this car? How many children? Okay. How many of our kids do we have to sell to buy one? So uh, we, we've done some very complicated math on this. And so to be honest, I'm going to encourage all of our dear viewers to duck on over to carsguide.com.au and read the story because a lot more detail than I can really go into here. But the short answer is that we would expect to see LC300 prices rise between about three and five or four and $5,000 across the board, not okay. including the GR Sport, which is going to basically set a new high point for the brand. Okay, so the, currently the Land Cruiser costs what, 81 to 131. I, I had a look last night. Uh, we're expecting that to go up by about five grand, you reckon? Yeah, so yeah. by my, my calculations, the Sahara at the moment, the, the, not the Horizon, but the yep. Sahara, yep. sells for 124,500. Yep. We'd expect to see that go to somewhere around 130,000. And then we would certainly expect the GR Sport trim to, to, to push north of 140. Um, or around that circa 140 mark. And it really does uh, create a new benchmark for a vehicle like this. I mean, that's a lot of money, man, 140 grand. Like, Although, have you seen what Toyota dealers are currently selling Demo exactly. 200 series for at the moment? Again, There's one down the road, $149,000 for a 2020 Sahara. The more, with more time and perfection from the good people at Toyota, because, you know, a year ago, we would have said, how much? <laughs> yeah. now, after the kind of madness that's occurred over the last six months, we're like, yeah, that seems about right. So don't do it. Don't do it. Don't buy one. Don't, no, I reckon, don't encourage I reckon, them. Wait, I reckon, wait for the new one. I reckon that 200 oh. series is going to be a classic. I reckon. <laughs> no way. No, it will be. <laughs> Major it's, classic. It's funny you should say that, Tom. I, uh, I wrote an opinion piece that did roughly, a few feathers which basically just called out lc 200 panic buyers and, and are they ready to admit they made a mistake because they, they've essentially paid over the odds for a car older than me that is on the precipice of being replaced by a car that's safer more technologically advanced more powerful better in almost every regard i know that there's talk of the lc 200 being a classic but mate that's what they said about the lc 102 like yeah that's true what they'll say about the lc 300 when we're talking about a hydrogen powered lc 400 and so on and so forth, you know. It's like, it's okay to be a classic, but it's going to be, you know, and, you know, it will be a classic eventually, right? Unless Toyota, you know, pull another 70 series and start building it again. Like the, but the, the, the difference, with the, the line between classic and just old is <laughs> yeah. very thin. Very thin. <laughs> I'm I'm like right on that that line at the moment myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. if, if you if you do go to the Toyota website, they've got and I, I had to dig through to find it, and I've actually signed up myself. Um, uh, there's an expression of interest section, um, and you go in, you enter your details. You're going to receive more marketing material than you, you're ever going to want, um, but that's what you, you sign up for, I guess. Um, you get sent a little email. 
and a little gift bag. Not a, it's not an actual physical gift bag. That'd be good though, Toyota. Um, but you get like a little video talking about the FJ40's trip up to Cape York um, and a whole lot of other nostalgic stuff as well, just to sort of get your appetite wet. Um, but yeah, go on, dig through. You'll find it there. It's under the Toyota, se- uh, the Land Cruiser section um, and check it out. Look, I, I hope that does put you in, you know, advanced standing. I have a feeling though, Chesto, and we've spoken to a few uh, Toyota buyers that when they're going into Toyota dealerships at the moment, looking at new models, mm-hmm. they're being told that they need to be part of a VIP program mm-hmm. before they can actually get into that car. But it's mad. It's mad. We, that, absolutely. We know somebody that went and put their money down on a new Kluger um, and then wanted to actually go and have a seat in it. And he's gone to the dealership and said, look, can I, can I sit in the Kluger? And they said, oh, look, it's only if you, um, you know, you, you sign up for a VIP program or if you're, you know, you're a previous owner of a Kluger. And he's like, I've just bought one. Yeah. And they've said, oh, so well, come on through, come on through. Um, so because of such short supply in Australia, they're limiting the people that can actually view one and see one. Time to be um, a better dealer, Richie. Did you see the story about the Yaris this week being essentially the GA Yaris is sold out? They, uh, as yes. of the 1st of July, they've stopped taking new orders on it. Uh, they won't say for how long, mm. but remember they they fought and fought and fought for extra allocation, mm. and they uh, it, it has long since uh, been exhausted, and people are still waiting for their vehicles. So rather than just create this perpetual problem, they've just said to people, "You can't buy one for the time being," which is yeah. like huge for a car that specified. You know, this tiny little three door pocket yeah. city car with a manual only transmission. They've sold, by, by my account, they've sold about 17, they've taken 1,700 orders for the regular GA Aris, mm. about another 500 for the more hardcore and very expensive rally. Yeah. So, I mean, that's they're, they're big numbers, man, 2,200 cars in the first 12 months. It's, it'd be a bad look, though, if you you know you sold them and then people weren't getting their cars for 18 months. So. Well, that's exactly what's happening now, yeah. my friend. They keep pushing back, the, they keep pushing back, essentially. So. At a six-month wait for a Rav Four at the moment, um, I can imagine that even though Chester, you were saying the Land Cruiser is being officially unveiled in August, and yeah. we'll probably see them arrive in Australia before the end of the year, but mm. you could it could be halfway or, or, or three quarters of the way through 2022 before you actually see your LC300. Well, that's right. Although we do know that, like in Toyota's genius planning phase they um they cut off lc200 manufacturing so they built a lot of cars yeah um, and then they cut yeah. off the 200 manufacturing and switched on lc300 manufacturing yeah, right right well before we saw that car so the hope is that they have you know some sort of backlog for them but the other the thing is though i would and you know this is a, a patented chesto no evidence theory but <laughs> they're always the best like theories how many customers are there in australia Yes. Or a vehicle, a, a north of $100,000 off road focused vehicle, right? And then how many of those customers bought an LC200? Because so many people in the last 12 months, like we reported earlier in the year that the LC200 had, has had its best year on sale ever. Yeah. Like 13 years later or whatever it was mm. uh, in 2021. So, how many of those people have just bought an LC200? They're, surely they're not ready to step up to an LC300 straight away, right? So, I don't know. Maybe it won't be the runaway sales success straight away that we think it will. And who who needs? I mean, who? I mean, I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this, but who needs a Land Cruiser? Yeah. I mean, you've got a Hyundai Palisade, which is an eight seater, which you know costs less than a Land Cruiser. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know how 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 many times are you going to go across the Nullarbor uh, in, you, in you, your Land Cruiser? You've, you've got, got it all wrong. I've got, got it all wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, what is no, that? No, no. Are you it's telling about- me the Land Cruiser is the equivalent <laughs> of R M Williams and Moleskins and a dry as a bone in the city, Tom? Yeah, you, I yeah. mean, you joke, but that's it, right? It's <coughs> yeah. like, it's the yeah. pretense that you're going yeah. to do that stuff. It doesn't matter yes. whether you do or not. It's like, no, no, no. I want to <laughs> either look like I'm going to do this or I want yeah. to feel like I'm going to do this. It's like, I want yeah. to sit in this thing and go like, yes, I can conquer anything, even though I'm driving 20Ks on the M5 to work <laughs> yep. every day. Like, that's all yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. great philosophy in the USA. They're like a, this marketing uh, sort of credo in the USA that I love. They say that 100% of Jeep customers take their vehicles hardcore off-roading, but 90% of them only do it in their minds. And I think that like, oh! <laughs> like perfectly capture that brand and vehicles like the, the the Land Cruiser as well. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people use them for what they're designed for, but a yeah. lot don't. But it's just the thought that they could if they wanted to, I think is the appeal. Yeah, it's- yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think that there's another element to the whole like people paying, you know, over 
100k for something like this in a heartbeat and it's the fact that debt is so cheap at the moment yeah like it's the same thing with house prices like you know what if i can afford the monthly i don't care yeah i don't care i don't care what the end number is it doesn't actually matter it's whether i can afford the monthly or not to have this thing right now it's great you're absolutely right people aren't going overseas they're not going on their you know their, 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 their skiing trips so they're like, you know, Graham, let's get a land cruiser and see Australia. Let's go to, let's go to Kakadu. Mate, I Kakadu, think Graham. Tip, there's not a lot of automotive journalists on that list. I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> any of my colleagues. From the top <laughs> well, well, look, with that, uh, look, land cruiser, look, we're, I'm sure there's going to be many more stories to, to, to come our way from, from you, Testo, as we get closer and closer to that August date. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got any questions, um, direct them straight through to Andrew. Andrew will, will know. Forget about Toyota. Bypass Toyota. Yep. Exactly. He's the man that Toyota go to to find out go, what they're doing. Go straight next. to the source. <laughs> yeah, it's true though, Tom. Didn't they tell you at an event you went to uh, that they said, you know, we read Testo's stories to find out what we're doing next? Yeah, pretty um, much. Yeah, and I think and, it was only half in jest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 absolutely. All right, talking of in jest and automated journalists, uh, we're going to talk about the cars that have been in our garage. Tom, you have been driving. It's a long-termer. It's the Subaru XV Hybrid. Uh, you liked some things about it. You didn't like the main thing about it, though. Yeah, um, so the car I've been uh, driving, and the funny thing is originally we were meant to have this car for three months, and mm. some unfortunate circumstances befell it. And then I didn't have it for a month and then I ended up with it for six months. So I'm not sure how that happened, but, um, <laughs> and, and actually the, the return date for this car keeps getting pushed back, you know, uh, cause we're in lockdown now in Sydney. Uh, yeah. I, I was just told yesterday, don't bother returning the car for two weeks. So I've got it for another two weeks. I don't even know what to wow. do with it. I've still got it. Um, but anyway, the, so Did it's the top. Sell it. Did I sell it? Yeah, well, I, I was actually chatting uh, to one of our video guys about this yesterday saying, uh, and he was asking, you know, eventually, surely, you just get squatters rights to this thing. Like, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> anyway. You're also living in the which is the, the unspoken part. That's how you get your squatters rights. Oh, no, yeah, we were joking about that too because I, I took it uh, on a bit of unsealed terrain a couple of weeks ago. So um, it was like still spattered with mud and stuff and all in the inside and everything. And, you know, we were filming it. And it's going, <laughs> do, do, do you want to clean it up? Well, I'm like, no, nah. just make it look like it's been lived in. Make it look like I've done some cool stuff with this I, car. Tom, so. I, I looked over your video before we published it and I did notice the mud everywhere. Guys, <laughs> yeah. if you want to go into YouTube, check out Tom's video. The car is filthy. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, we, we had some good fun in it. And, and like, that's the thing about the XV is it, it like, I think, and I, I do say this in the vid, like it, it's the kind of car that does live up to the promise that it is on the tin. It's like, it, mm. it's a city sized SUV. It's easy to park. It's really convenient to live with. But then if you do want to take it on some unsealed stuff on the weekend, it's, it's capable enough to do that. Yeah. I wouldn't take it on anything like hardcore, like proper four wheel drive tracks. But if you want to mm. go on some, like some gravel, a little bit of sand, it, it can do that. And the, it's great at that stuff, actually. That all-wheel drive system, the super all-wheel drive system, the asymmetrical, um, you know, yeah. symmetrical four-wheel drive is is really really good. I've I've taken XVs places you will, you'd never take a you know a CHR or you know something like that or you know yeah. HRV or something like that. No way. Um, but the boot's tiny, isn't it? It's, it's yeah there, there, there's some catches with it, and and so the one the one we had was the the, the absolute pinnacle of the range. The um, hybrid s i had to everyone has like a 2.0 in it except yeah. the hybrids they're yeah. just hybrid s um, so I had to, yeah i had to manually remove the 2.0 in my brain but anyway um that car yeah has a small boot the hi- hybrid interestingly actually has a slightly bigger boot than the non-hybrid because it doesn't That's have fair. a spare wheel yeah well um, the, the puncture the, repair kit yeah it's got a puncture repair kit but the floor is still raised compared to the non-hybrid it just doesn't have the spare if that makes sense puncher repair kits are crap you know why because i've got a puncher in them before and i've filled it up with i've got the little compressor out and i've got the goo and i've put it in and and it's gone and and the the tires you know inflating and then all the goo starts coming out the hole where the puncher is and then the tire went down again so it nothing, like you just nothing didn't follow the instructions, but <laughs> no, I, I don't like instructions and I don't follow like following. Um, but um, yeah, look, I, I think there's nothing bit to spare. Um, yeah, no, it, oh, it's it's oh. very true, mm-hmm. and like especially, uh, it is an odd thing for a car that has this kind of 
off-road pretense. It's like, okay, you can go off-road, but if you hit the wrong rock, then you have to use a puncture repair kit. Like, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, that's a bit odd about it. And the other thing is it's it claims to be a hybrid, right? And yep. so, and that should be a really big selling point. It's a big deal for Subaru. It's the first time they've been able to sort of have these mainstream hybrids on the market. It's the same system that goes in the Forester and it, does work a little bit differently from the Toyota hybrids. So I think a big important thing that a lot of people are going to maybe miss or uh, be intentionally misled on is the fact that hybrids are all different in the way they work, where the motor is located, how much power it has, how much battery life you get with the hybrid yeah. system, all this sort of stuff. And so there are many factors to consider, but I think the important one, even in the XV, is the fact that it has a really weak electric motor and it's located in the CVT transmission. Yeah, it's and like, it's like sixty. No, it's. I was looking at the outputs of that electric motor, and it's it not. It's not driving any wheels. That's for sure. Well, yeah. So that's yeah. the thing, and and it's asked to drive all four in Jeez. the system because it's symmetrical all wheel drive. So that you know, it has yeah. no choice but to drive all four wheels. Mm. And in the system as it is, it's only got twelve kilowatts and sixty six newton meters. Yeah, which. Back in ye olde times was plenty to move a car, but now well, when a car weighs 18, almost 90s. two tons. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> when a car weighs almost two tons and drives all four wheels, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing about it is it doesn't save you any fuel. So <laughs> my no ultimate point. verdict, yeah, none, yeah. literally none. Like, uh, like I drove, so, and I tried everything in that car. I tried like two or three weeks straight, just milling in traffic, trying to make the most. And you can, it's, it's annoying because you can drive it on the electric motor, but it's like mm. a, the briefest moment when you take off. It's like, hey, hey, and then the ele- and then the engine turns on. You're like, ah, why? I see a little bit more. It actually makes that noise, like Mr. Burns. It makes a weird noise. It makes it. It's like I don't know how to describe it. It's like okay, if you got a if you got like a spatula or something, and you yeah. you like rotated <laughs> it in the bottom of a pot, that kind of resonant noise it makes. That's the noise the car makes when it's running on electric. Like car ads, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I mean, if you've ever hear engineers talk, and I've sort of sat across you know, a table from a whole lot of engineers eating lunch before, they all use those type of terms. They really do. They go, "Oh, the ticket, ticket, ticket sound." Oh, yeah, no, it's it's more of a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They've got their whole language. Now, Andrew, you have yes. been Andrew. I never call you Andrew. Oh, Chester, Chester, that's weird, yeah. isn't it? Uh, Chester, you've been in a Volkswagen Tiguan. I have. Um, what's What's new and different about that? What Tell well, I'm that. so glad that uh, my esteemed colleague Tom's review was so detailed as my life with this vehicle has pretty much existed during the lockdown that we shan't call a lockdown. Yep. So I can tell you all about what the Volkswagen Tiguan 110 TSI is to drive to the supermarket, <laughs> and back from the supermarket and back to the supermarket, etc. Well, yeah. it's probably going to spend most of its life doing that. So, yeah, exactly. you know, it's a proper test. Real world yeah. test. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a race track. it's, uh, it's 30, about 39,690 RRP or 44,479 drive away. So about 45 grand or 44 and a half grand drive away. Um, it is a 110 kilowatt, 1.4 litre engine in, in that model, which is actually is plenty for that vehicle. And mate, I, I got to say, I, I can't go into depth here because I have not done a lot of long distance driving or any of our usual sort of test routes, but it just remains a really impressive SUV, the Tiguan. Mm. Uh, it, it, if it's not my favorite in that segment, it's close to it. Um, it just feels like the, it, it just exudes this sense of quality and premiumness at every touch point from the moment you grab the door handle to the moment you turn it on and grab the wheel. It just feels like a quality offering in the segment. Um, and yeah, look, the one, 110 TSI is not the biggest engine in the family, but for me in urban life, it, it, it has felt like plenty. Um, and again, I mean, look, I've done, I've done almost no driving in it, so uh, I can't give you too much more information than that. But it is, I, I, I maintain it's just a quality product in that segment and should be on your, on your drive list if you're looking for SUVs of that class. But Tom, you can probably fill in a few of the gaps here, given you did the launch of it. Yeah, that, I mean, there's a few small catches with that car. Again, it's like it's now more expensive than it's ever been. So it's mm. like, and Volkswagen, they have a reasoning behind this. They say, um, you know, when people were coming in to buy cars like the uh, like the previous Tiguan, previous Golf, people were splashing on options anyway to this price point. So mm. they say, well, this is where the customer is. We may as well just start the car here and just have all the features in it already. 
Um, so for, I guess from their perspective, it makes sense. And, you know, there'll be buyers who go, oh, you know, it's, it's more expensive than ever. And yeah, okay, that's true. But actually this is what you were going to spend anyway, regardless. So, um, and the other thing about it, um, which is really interesting, and this is kind of this big, um, you know, geo political thing with Volkswagen at the moment is the fact that the Tiguan, it's an update 1.4 liter, 110 TSI engine still has the seven speed dual clutch transmission, but the Golf 8, which is a new generation, has a new ASIN 8-speed torque converter mated to that engine. Ooh. And the thing about this engine is, like, <clears throat> you know it's a really good engine, but you can't make the most of it with that dual clutch. Mm. But with that 8-speed ASIN, it's awesome. So I'm actually really disappointed that the Tiguan doesn't get that 8-speed so ASIN. What's the reasoning for Because Volkswagen has always been the DSG brand. Yeah. What's the reason we're going with torque converter in the Golf? Is that the new shift for all future Volkswagen or just for yeah, that? Model? Yeah. Is it an, an admission of defeat? Have they got it's, it wrong? It's a shift away from um, the way they build that engine for global markets. So in Europe, you can't get the A-speed ASIN in anything. Mm. Um, it's only 1.5 Evo, which is the new version of 110 TSI. Um, and that's mated to a dual clutch still. And it's all about getting emissions down. Yeah, yeah. Whereas mm. in global markets, they've decided, well, you guys don't care about emissions, so we can put a theoretically less efficient transmission with your car, even though it's way better to drive, especially to the shops. Yeah. 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 Well, talking about efficiency, I've been driving in my garage a Lexus UX. Now it is it's it's Lexus's tiniest uh, SUV. It's the luxury, so it's it's the UX's entry grade. It costs forty four thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. And look, I, it's, it's been my long term. I've had it now for the last six weeks. I'm now moving into the hybrid version of it. But yeah, look, this has got a two liter uh, four cylinder uh, petrol engine, 126 kilowatts, 205 newton meters. And it is really, really comfortable. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the great thing about having long term is, is, and I think Tom, you mentioned this in your Subaru video, is that you kind of, you've got this long term, which sort of runs for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then you get your, your weekly test car come in. And it's really good to compare your long term with the, the current car that you're coming through your own, you know, you know, the, the one week test. And the the UX is has been the car that I, I drive when I just don't want to be bothered. It's 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 just a no fuss. You don't have to think. It's comfortable. The the seats are in, incredible. The stereo has perfect sound. Um, it's just a really easy car to drive. The ride's really comfortable. It's just, it's just, it's pretty effortless. Uh, so look, that's that's my takeaway from that car. It is small, but it's big enough for you know we've got a little family. We've only got a six year old and myself and my wife. Um, the boot's just big enough. It fits our kids' BMX in there and a scooter and a helmet and a bag. Um, but you know when you're us, you don't need that much more space. So it's it's kind of good. Um, yeah, look, it's got a bigger boot, I think, than say the the Super XV that you're in, I'd have to double check that. It feels bigger than that. It feels deeper. Uh, it's got a, it doesn't have a spare wheel. It's got a, you know, a punch from a repair kit as well. So I hope I don't have to break down. Um, no, but it's been a good thing. I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, I'll be jumping into the hybrid this time. I'm going to see, you know, if there's going to be much difference between you know, the fuel economies. I, I'm not expecting there to be a great difference, mm. um, but I haven't been trying to save fuel. And then once again, I've been, driving it to the shops and yeah, yeah and to the australian reptile park as well it's 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 actually it's car the the, the color is khaki metal um but it's kind of like a this lizard green um which is, which is appropriate <laughs> for the reptile park but yeah no, it's been a good thing to get around in um, i actually think though richard right you, you're a, a tall person yes do you feel claustrophobic in that car because when i had that car ages ago it was like a year and a half yeah. ago now i like I'm not as tall as you, and even I felt claustrophobic in the cabin. Like it's a very cramped cabin. It's you sit really low though, so it's good if you've got long legs. Mm -hmm. um, like a you know like like it's funny. Uh, a lot of sports cars fit tall people really well because they've got these really long footwells. Mm -hmm. Like they're like sitting in a bathtub with your feet up on the you know the taps type of thing. And the the Lexus, or a lot of Lexuses are the same thing. They've got this really long sort of footwell. Um, but it is, it, it, it feels like you're sitting inside like, um, you know, a cushion. Everything's sort of like packed in with this plush sort of soft touch material. But yeah, no, look, it's been fine. You wouldn't want to be, you know, 
Andre the Giant in there, but you know, I don't think Andre would fit in many cars. But and if if, if I, I can think... theorize, I reckon you will actually save a bit of fuel with the hybrid because I think that car is the right size for the hybrid yeah. system. Yeah. I don't think anyone wants to be Andre the Giant. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out about the fuel economy. Look, one thing we're not going to find out about are cars that aren't coming to Australia. Last week's episode, uh, we talked about Kiwi cars uh, that we don't get here. Uh, so, look, let's just go through the feedback. The feedback, my goodness, back by popular demand is the feedback section of the Cars Guide podcast. Um, and, look, there's been a lot of feed. There's been a lot of back. Um, I'm just going to go through. Has though, there been I, more, I, more of one of this than the other, Richie? Or has it been there's a, there's, there's, I'd say there's more back than feed. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> let's just start here. Phil Brewer. Um so uh, Phil says the reason why Australia isn't being offered electric hybrid and um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles is because our federal leaders are firmly ensconced in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry and won't incentivize the electric market. Plus our state governments are going to hit electric car buyers with a road tax. He's not wrong. Um, well, he's not wrong about the car tax. I'm not sure about the politics of it all. Um, but we were talking about in that episode how there are so many electric variants of cars that we've got here in australia that we you know we just don't have like an electric tucson yeah. um that type of thing electric transit for transit van um it, let's it, it's actually deeper than that though i reckon guys mm. like, look he, he's he's basically right there but we are fast approaching a point where you you just don't need government subsidies and maybe if i'm being totally honest with you i'm not a huge fan of the idea of subsidizing very expensive cars that are that, that you know so taking a sixty nine thousand dollar car and making it sixty six thousand dollars is probably isn't going to be that big an impact to someone who's spending seventy thousand dollars on a car. Whereas most most people or a lot of people shop between that twenty to forty bracket anyway. Yeah. The reality is a lot of cars are coming in at that price point. We know that MG, for example, is already here. They're currently working on an even cheaper EV that's going to sit below the ZS, for example. Uh, uh, BYD is making all sorts of noise about a thirty thousand dollar EV in Australia. Yes. But yeah. Uh, the ID three is meant to be about forty k as well. So, so I'm talking yeah. full battery electric here, not necessarily hybrid or plug-in hybrid but we are fast approaching a point where that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper yeah and the price point of those vehicles is coming down accordingly so we're really not that many years away from spending 25 to 30 grand on an electric car yeah that's true now moving on to um now gosh this is, this is an interesting moniker it's it's xxptam max xpta max uh, anyway he knows who he is he says australia or, or she uh, Australia gets more manuals, though, and that, that's, that's actually a good point. We do get a lot of manual um, you know, variants of cars here. We can't even get a manual Corolla or Mazda 3 anymore in New Zealand. Oh, sorry, it must be a Kiwi. Australia gets those. Can we swap some SUVs for some manuals? I'm sure we could work out a deal. We could no send way. over some manuals. What? I, ha I, have no, I have no pity for this guy because he can what? just grey import any manual Japanese <laughs> yeah. car he wants. That's yeah. the joy of New Zealand. You can have any car you want. Anyway. You can have any car you want as long as it's Japanese. Like, just dude, just import it. <laughs> Excellent. John Bitt says, best show in two weeks and six days. Uh John's obviously not counting. He does one of these faces, one of these faces, one of these faces, and two thumbs up. Thanks, guys, he says. Anchor S says, while there are more models Ford can bring in, one variant they can definitely include in the lineup is the Puma um, mild hybrid EV, the manual hybrid. Yep. Oh, yes, that's true. Exactly true, actually. It's only offered in petrol at the moment. Uh, Peter Panousis. Ah. Oh a good friend of the Cars Guide podcast. He says, great show, guys. I'm pinning my hopes on the Cupra next year, delivering products which are both desirable and affordable. So far this year also, the cars I've been pining over have ended up being overpriced or underwhelming. I realise Cupra is the performance arm of Say It, but I'm hoping that they'll be coming under the existing Volkswagen Group prices to remain competitive. It doesn't hurt that they look damn good too. Oh, mm. He says, P.S. Peter Panousis is a mouthful, so please feel free to call me Maverick or Mav or Peter Pan <laughs> or Pan or Panasonic. Well, um, thank you, Panasonic. Uh, that's <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I, I really like I really like the alliteration of Peter Panousis. Yeah, <laughs> Peter Panousis, I like it. It rolls off the tongue. It I'm does. That is, you might know more about this than I do, Tom, but I'm not sure Cooper can be that cheap, can it? I mean, there's there's a like there is a, a lower 
barrier you're not going to be able to break through. I, I can't see them being any cheaper than Skoda or equivalents. No you? way, no way. And and like Volkswagen have said, you know, uh, it's going to be kind of a performance alternative, I, I guess, yeah. to Skoda. And the thing of um, Skoda is they've tried multiple times to sell cheaper Skodas and no one buys them. Yeah. So it's not a price thing. It's a brand positioning thing. It's yeah. like, okay, the buyer for a say it will be like, okay, we're oh, Cooper um, mm. is going to be okay, you know, for 40, 50 grand, that kind of yeah, you know, we yeah, talk about you know, debt being <laughs> cheap. A, such a great return to history. I don't know if anyone remembers, the, I, I think it was the price is right. The, the the showcase was always a say it at the end. Yeah. Yes, so, was it say it I beat her or <laughs> yes, what's the, what, so what's the other one? Say it, uh, Leon, it there, yeah, Leon. Oh, Absolute peak in those in those days. <laughs> I think I think Cooper is going to be uh, quite a bit better than that. We've had we've had some a lot of Cooper fans actually. Cooper love going on. Aaron X says the Formenta looks sick, and mm-hmm. we we agree. And down here under Peter Benu says, Sing, Senor Bob says Cooper sounds and looks great to me. Two hundred and eighty seven kilowatts turbo, and he says I assume that's petrol. And yes, you're absolutely right, Senor Bob. It's going to be the same five cylinder turbo petrol engine that's in the RSQ three. So um, good, that type. So of thing. good. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's a my favorite Audi engine. It's going to be a beast um and look look to your credit uh tom and and, and chester it's it's probably not going to be a cheap um you know uh you know say it cooper uh but it is probably going to be an affordable version of you know an rsq3 so um yeah well that's you know, true too. yeah sa- save some money get the same technology same engine t-bone T-Bone says you have to remember four or five star ratings are almost exclusive oh now this is what we were talking about um the dacia duster uh, which New Zealand gets that Australia doesn't get. Yes. Uh, JC pointed out that it only has a three-star rating or a very low rating. Uh, and Mal, Mal said there's no way that it should come into Australia then. What? Um, T-Bone and, and JC brought up the Mustang. Anyway, it goes on. you got to see it. They're both of them, Mal almost walks out of the room. It's, it's so upset. Oh, uh, no Dacia, way. I would love yeah. a Dacia Duster. I know. Well, well, looks, I think it's meant to be said Dutch here, isn't it? But whatever. Dutch, anyway, Dutch, I want Dutch, one. You would love <laughs> to be here, but you wouldn't rush out to buy one. <laughs> no way. I, I would love to drive one. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Maybe not buy one. Yeah, yeah, look, good point. T, t, <laughs> T-Bone's, T-Bone's a fan. He's a fan of the, of, of the Duster. He says, you have to remember that four or five star ratings almost exclusively are given because of additional safety assistance, like brake assistance, lane keeping, collision warning, that type of thing. He says the Dacia Duster itself is relatively sturdy and safe. I don't get why the Aussies are so concerned about safety and then they drive old crappy Hiluxes and just with a bull bar on. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really interesting, isn't it? Like uh, the ANCAP has moved the bar for safety so far now that it, it it's gone into the realm of center airbags mm. and freeway speed auto emergency braking and nighttime cyclist detection stuff that was yes. science fiction even yes, five years ago. So yeah. you know, like you got to remember, it, you know, if someone t bones you in a in a Dacia Duster, it's probably just as safe as a Golf or something. But you yeah. know. Mate, you're, you're onto my special subject here because I have ranted about this before. But mate, I, I just think the safety system in Australia is flawed, and I will tell you why. You can because they allow car companies to use outdated testing. So, like, if your vehicle was tested in 2016 or 2017, for example, and got five stars, it you can display your five stars with a tiny little "as tested in 2016" beneath it. Mm. And a car that has all the sci-fi tech that Tom just mentioned is is five stars as well. Now, those cars might be light years apart in terms of active safety technology, but you can't tell me that the average buyer, and I always think of my mum and dad when I'm thinking of an average buyer, would look at that and have any kind of understanding of what those two stars mean and are they mm. different? What does, what was, how did the testing criteria change between 2016 and 2020? Like, I don't know. I just think if you're going to test vehicles, you need to test the newest ones as soon as they come out and that's it. And, as and soon it's as- valid for like, like the, a model year or something, you know? Exactly. And as soon as the rules change, if you shift the goalposts, then you need to sort of reevaluate all the vehicles you've given five star to in the past, or at least the ones that are still currently on sale because it needs to be a level playing ground. Yeah, yeah. because it's, it was controversial when um, Kia launched the Stonic here and it was allowed to carry its, not not even its uh, Euro NCAP safety rating from when it was rated when it launched elsewhere in the world. It was the Euro rating for the Rio 
or yes. something like that. Yes. Like it had, it was, there was this bizarre like disconnect from the car that launched in Australia and the one that was rated originally is crazy. It's maybe, really maybe, e- to do that too. maybe each year a new star is added so that five star cars are no longer <laughs> six star cars and then you just keep adding a star. So yep. then you know, I don't know, maybe that's genius. Maybe it's stupidity. When but I'll tell you what. 20, 20 star and cap. So. <laughs> yes, yes. Because, you know, you, there are some, you know, car websites that say, you know, with a five star rating and you read the fine print and it's from 2014. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hammer Rocks knows what's happening. Hammer. The only thing I know about Dacia is the ongoing James May joke with it in Top Gear. But it's amazing how our priorities have changed when buying new cars these days. He says, I remember in the 1990s how car brand executives and many motoring journalists used to say that safety doesn't sell. Look at us now. We demand 100 plus airbags, ABS, AEB, ESC, five star ratings, etc. He's absolutely right. Safety is is now sexy. It's the safety sells. As Mate, I, say. I, I get a few of the, the details wrong here, but I think it was Hyundai Memory Service when, it, when airbags were becoming a new thing and it was an optional extra on, on one of their models. And of course, nobody ticked it. So when yeah. they had to pair it with a better stereo, and then everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, but that, that's true. I mean, you know, the only reason I, I, the only thing I would argue there is I don't know that we do demand all that stuff, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I know that ANCAP demands it. Um, and I know that yeah. car companies are, are, are very keen to get a five star rating, but does the yeah. buyer demand you yeah. know, a center airbag or, 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 or whatever? No, they demand Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I think exactly. I think I think there's like a big time two elements to that argument too, because it's like okay, well, because ANCAP's pushing for this, you know, ever increasing five star rating, it forces manufacturers to put this safety gear in cars, which is good for everyone because the cars mm. ultimately become safer. Mm. But on the other end. You know, you're right. Consumers don't care, and it pushes the prices of cars up for features that were science fiction five years ago and aren't act, like in in the ultimate. They might save you from getting into a crash, but if someone, if it's not your fault, if someone's crashing into you, for example, it might have little to no difference. Like the center airbag will, but we're still mm-hmm. seeing cars come out now. They're five star and cap. You know, they've got the same set of airbags that they had ten years ago, mm-hmm. but they just have all this active stuff now. Yeah, so is right. that is that really a safer car? Like if someone T-bones you in an intersection, it's not your fault? Yeah. No, exactly. And a car that's five stars today will be one star in 20 years. Time. Yeah. And we, and we, sorry, the other element I did allude to the fact of this too, is that there's certain cars that people know that they're not safe and they don't care. Like Suzuki Jimny, yeah. Ford Mustang, like whatever. Like well, I just want this car because it's what I want, you know. Yeah. I it's drive a lifestyle a, car. I drive a 1951 <laughs> Ford twin spinner. It's you, you probably can't get any less safe than that. It's made probably out of, not made out of wood, isn't it? Very yeah. Nice. Are you even no, allowed to have life insurance? You, I, it's very <laughs> hard to get it. Um, Ian, we're going to whisk through these last ones Sorry, here. Ian, Ian Thomas, he says New Zealand, being a small test market, gets new, gets these new models. Australia, as a larger market, would make it unprofitable. He says it makes sense. Um, Matt, Matt, Matt Ginger. Uh, I hope I've said that right. He says, yeah, we get Skodas in New Zealand with, and their popularity is increasing. Skoda has actually taken a large contract <laughs> to provide superb wagons for the New Zealand police voice. Police voice? <laughs> police force? <laughs> um, I was going a bit Kiwi then. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Davis, Dacia is trendy as anything in Europe. Shame we can't access the brand here given MG is under a cloud, which is currently kicking entry goals here. Uh, Doherty Quinn says the rich stay rich by spending. Oh, hang on a second. That, that's spam. Actually, someone spammed the website <laughs> and there are 25 replies to it. Ah. And uh, it's just total spam. So ignore that one. Mark Sultana says Ari the Dacia Duster. All right, it's getting a lot of love, the Duster. You so guys cool. are also forgetting that the Suzuki Jimny is also three star and cap car, yeah. but it doesn't stop it selling like hot cakes. Not yeah. just here in Oz, but worldwide. I really think ANCAP ratings are OTT these days. It used to be about the crash structure of the car and the number of airbags. And now I believe it's too much emphasis on electronic safety aids. Yeah, I agree. Well, it, it, we, we all we were all agreeing then. TGV, another big fan of ours and a very quick train. Um, 
This might be a long reply, and it is. So, TJV, I'm only going to just read the first sentence of it. It's, it looks like it's about 480 words long. Um, this might be a long reply. The big issue with EV take up here is infrastructure. He's absolutely mm. right. I've been watching Alex on Auto's YouTube channel. I've just given them a good plug there. As his, as his Ford Mark E, won't use any other name, with dual motor and extended battery. And he's doing long distance testing that vehicle and other brands of it. Um, Look, he's absolutely right. We just don't have this infrastructure set up here. But at the same time, it's kind of a two-way street. You've got to get the cars coming in to have that, you know, the catalyst for the structure to, to come yeah. to place. Actually, I, I agree to an extent. Like uh, a lot of the electric cars that are now this, particularly this model year being launched, actually have enough range for Australia. I think once you've mm. got, you know, 400-ish kilometers of range, that's plenty. The yeah. problem is yeah. charging it up. So, yeah. you know, if you've got 400 Ks range, you only need to charge up what, like one and one and a third time to get to Brisbane from Sydney, for example. Yeah. And like, that's a very reasonable thing to do. If Most you've got a DC charger. Less than once a week, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That kind of range. Exactly. And, and to the government's credit, you know, I think it's uh, partially federal and partially state here in New South Wales, but they did install a whole bunch of AC charging units in local car parks. And so <laughs> for me now, I just maintenance charge. Like when I've got an electric car, I just go and plug it in at my local council parking lot and get a coffee and I get 50 to 100 Ks range if I, yeah. you know. That'll do. Yeah. 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 I know, I, I, I've, I've got this argument at the moment that, that'll rile up the Tesla, uh, Tesla Rati, but I, so what's basically happening at the moment, I want to rant here, so everyone <laughs> do it, do it. We're not going anywhere yet. Everyone, hang on, let me just undo my belt a bit. Right so on. basically, you know the Tesla supercharger network, right? Across Australia. Yep. Yes. And, and then we have our other DC fast charging networks run by people like ChargeFox or the NRMA or whoever, right? Now, the thing is, nobody but Tesla can use the Tesla supercharging network, but everybody, including Tesla, can use the DC charging network. And I was in Goulburn the other day, right? And I pulled up to this DC charger in an Audi, and there were three Teslas queued up to get onto the to, to the ChargeFox DC charger. Supercharger up the road, two k, literally two k's down the road, was empty. So I did a bit of digging to figure out why, and it's because the, the supercharger rates have increased to something like fifty two cents per kilowatt hour, and basically the uh, NRMA service, I think from memory, is about forty two cents, and then it drops again if you're an NRMA member to something starting with a three, right? Mm. So Tesla people who are a member of NRMA, mm. and even those who aren't, know they can get ten cents cheaper power by charging into the regular ones. But what that means is that the already limited infrastructure we have in Australia is becoming even mm. more limited because you've got supercharger mm. networks sitting empty while everybody, Tesla and everyone else, is queuing up for the regular DC charging network. So that's something that I do think has to change. I reckon Tesla should unlock their supercharger <laughs> for everybody. Yeah. Um, Good point. Good point. It, it, what you're talking about could get really nasty, though. Like, we're talking like, okay, you know, we're going to software lock people out, yeah, you know, yeah. per manufacturer. And then we're going to talk, okay, certain manufacturers make certain deals with certain companies so that you can yeah. charge your car there at a lower rate. And it, I just think it gets dirty and it gets nasty. And but Tesla, Tesla started has, it. But <laughs> done it. No one else has done it. Yeah. yeah. So the biggest selling EV brand in Australia. Yeah. Is- logging up everyone else's bloody charges it's annoying well, anyway. and I, I have a feeling it's going to get even more nasty uh guys um last couple of comments here i want to read them all because everyone's <laughs> got to so much trouble to to write in um we've got saab he says i think jc or maybe even richard oh thanks um should do a 10 week 10 cars in the garage nothing over 50k base model poverty pack the cheaper the better mahindra suzuki fiat havel ldv that type of stuff good job guys i think the cars guide clothing looks great in the video reviews oh thanks um might be able to send you a t-shirt um, i'd love to do that uh, ba- base model 10 week challenge yes Literally. it would be great <laughs> hsv commodore now he's he's written in and said or they, or they have written in and says another interesting car sold in nz but not in oz is the toyota corolla wagon um oh. yep We'd like to see that. Absolutely. DeCook, hey, right? Or DeCook has replied, um, very good friend of the podcast, says, "What? wow, it baffles me so much. There is so much talk about in the last year in the podcast, but now it's gone. Seems like a conspiracy of car makers to make Aussie buyers forget about city cars and wagons. Even the few who are interested to buy one can't get one in dealerships at all. Mm. And then they talk about nobody buys these segments anymore and you have to look at the book. You have to book them for good. Hammer Rock says, does New Zealand have the equivalent of ADRs, Australian design rules, or do they simply go with the European standards? Uh, look, I'm sure they do have their own local ADR rules. 
uh, but we can look into that for you. Um, De, Cook, De Cook's reply says, you couldn't agree more. Peugeot has pushed him seriously hot metal. We're talking about that new Peugeot 308 and the electric version of it as well. Um, check out last week's podcast. Um, the car looks amazing and we're not getting it. Roto- so does the 208, by the way. 208 oh, looks great. Yes. Roto, yes, the 208. Um, Roto Ihu says, um, well, T in the S. Now, that's tools in the shed. Um, you touched on my pet peeve. Uh, Hyundai New Zealand, not disputing Hyundai make good cars, and New Zealand is getting a good selection. But look at the pricing here. For the price of a mid-spec four-wheel drive hybrid RAV4, 47K, you can't even get a base two-wheel drive, two-litre Atmo Tucson starting at 50k you took a deep breath in this podcast at the 76k price tag of the palisade we'll try in new zealand it's a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for the same vehicle yeah top top spec diesel santa fe how does a ninety thousand dollars grab oh, you man. It's and mad. before you say cars are just more expensive there a top spec cx9 in new zealand is seventy two thousand dollars the new kluger grande hybrid is 75k Oh, he says, and on top of that, and to top it all off, Hyundai offers the worst warranty in the New Zealand market, just three years, 100Ks. That's, geez, that's not good. And, Final- and last time I was in New Zealand, it, fuel was $2.50 a litre. So. That's crazy. Are, are, they a factory, are they a factory backed in? Because, you know, Toyota is a, a private importer. In, that's in, right, yeah. Are they a private importer too, or are they a factory operation? I will that's have, really, to, we'll have to look really into that too. Yeah, like- Absolutely. Final, final, final <laughs> comment from Wax Triple Three. Hey, again, and it's only appropriate that's on the Dacia Duster. He said it, the, the Duster isn't worth the 30K price tag in New Zealand. <laughs> so many other better vehicles in that price range, such as MG, Sangyong, or Havel. Now, with that, we have reached the end of the podcast. There we go. I want to say thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chesto. Thank you, everyone. And to Mr. Pritchard, they call him the Gordon Ramsay of producers. Now, today he's wearing a T-shirt which says, ask me about my giraffe. And he's wearing Nicolas Cage face tracksuit pants. Now, if, you, if you're listening to this, you've, you've really got to like, go to the YouTube version of this and, and check them out. They're terrifying, those Nicolas Cage t- tracksuit pants. Let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on, or, and fa- on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Uh, we'll read out all your comments if you, if, or we'll try and get through them. There's stacks. Um, <laughs> if you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us and make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all of our latest comments. Now, JC always ends with a joke. Are we so getting I've, a reprieve? I've got a joke. No, no, I've got a joke. I've got, this is, this is a very JC joke because it's such a dead joke. Um, here we go. Why does putting a car in reverse make you nostalgic? It takes you back. Oh, my dear Lord. How good is that? Uh, I'm so sorry, everyone. (laughs) It takes you back. Watching the subscribers (laughs) nosedive after that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs)